Hi, I'm Becca Powers with the Wallingford Rotary Club, and I'll be interviewing Mr. Dennis Mannion, Marine Corps Vietnam veteran. So thank you for doing this interview. I was the oldest of five children. I had three brothers right behind me and a sister a couple years after that. My father was an FBI agent, uh, and we traveled, moved to different parts of the country. And did you have any siblings that were in the service as well? Of, of my three brothers, two served in the military. My brother John was in the Army. He had gone on to a ROTC scholarship at uh, Niagara University and served. But the war in Vietnam had ended right around the time he was graduating. And my youngest brother, Michael, was also in the Army. Uh, went through a ROTC program as well at John Carroll out in Ohio and served. And he did, actually did a career in the military, did mm -hmm. 25 years and retired as a full colonel. So what did you do before you entered the service? Well, I graduated high school in 1964. I went to a private boys' school, was a football player. Graduated in 64 with grades that weren't great, but my mm -hmm. father asked me to apply at Notre Dame in South Bend where he had gone and graduated from in the 30s. I didn't think I'd get in, so I didn't apply, but he applied for me, and somehow, some way, I got accepted. I was supposed to go to Vermont to play football, but I ended up going out to South Bend, and I loved it at South Bend. I had a wonderful two years there. In the mm -hmm. fall of 66, when I should have been a junior out at Notre Dame, and all my high school buddies were in colleges throughout New England, I was living at home and paving roads for the North Haven Construction Company. What branch of the military did you serve in? I saw a Marine Corps recruiter in October of 1966. I didn't tell a soul, and believe me, there were not a lot of people coming through the front door of Marine Corps recruiting offices in 1966. And he, I wanted two years, he wanted four, it was like trying to buy a car, mm -hmm. we finally settled on three. And is that like the branch of the military you wanted to go into? The reason I picked the Marine Corps is because I knew it would get me to Vietnam the, fa the fastest. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go. I'd read all the books about World War II, seen movies about World War II in Korea, and I thought it seems adventurous, it seems like a great opportunity to get out of Connecticut mm -hmm. and get away from my parents. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Instead of joining the Peace Corps, I joined the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are really stupid reasons mm -hmm. to join. Uh, I look back on it now, it was a pretty foolish decision in a lot of ways. I got out of uh, boot camp in March of 67. I went to infantry school at Camp Lejeune. And I thought for sure from infantry school, I'd be going over to Vietnam. Most, most Marines were at that point. But I was sent to the Naval Gunfire School on Coronado Island in San Diego, California and at the Naval Amphibious Base. And I spent 10 weeks there learning to adjust and control naval gunfire. I left for Vietnam on a Continental jet out of Los Angeles Airport on the 20th of September, 1967. So what are some of your favorite memories from serving in Vietnam? I have indelible memories. I don't yeah. particularly have favorite ones. Yeah. I remember close friends, particularly the ones who were killed. Um, I remember the weather. I remember not showering or washing any part of my body, face, hands, armpits, or anything from the last week of November 67 to the last week of April in 1968. I remember going through the siege of Quezon, which was a 77-day fight in the spring of 68, um, living on the ground, sleeping on pieces of cardboard in a bunker with three other Marines for 77 days. I remember very little sleep in those times because as the FO, I got woken up all the time. I do not think that I got more than three hours sleep in any 24-hour period for 77 plus days. And, mm -hmm. and that's because I'd get woken up, do something, go back to sleep. 20 minutes later, they'd wake me up again. Half hour later, they'd wake me up again because they needed more artillery here or there. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the memories. I have no real memories of civilians because I wasn't around civilians. Except for the first month when I was on convoy duty, I saw civilians. But other than that, I was in the demilitarized zone, the mm -hmm. DMZ, and it was a free fire zone. If they were out there, you could shoot at them without asking any questions. Mm -hmm. so. so what kind of friendships did you form with the people you were serving with? In not real close ones. Mm -hmm. uh, not real close ones. You'd think just the opposite. I was very friendly with a couple of guys. Um, one was a, an officer in my company, uh, Lieutenant Fordham. He and I were very close. And the, the reason for the distance was y you, you never know when people are going to get taken out, mm -hmm. wounded or killed, badly wounded or killed. And so there's a real hesitancy to become very close. But when you get into the upper 
areas where fighting can occur, you're, you're, you do establish some friendships. This Lieutenant Fordham went through the siege of Quezon with me. He and I would talk almost every night. He'd come by my bunker almost every night during the siege. And then we were getting ready to leave Quezon in, the, in this April of 68, and he was killed the day we were leaving. Um, so that's a, an ache that stays with me. A couple other real good friends, my radio operator um, was wounded, um, took a tiny piece of shrapnel that went through his flak jacket during the fighting at Quezon. He suffered uh, a slight tear in the upper muscle very near his heart. Uh, he was medevaced out and then he um, got out of the Marine Corps. He was 22 years old and he was walking to his college class in Baltimore, Maryland and he dropped dead of a heart attack. And my third closest friend was a kid named Trey Mead who survived the 13-month tour with me. He was a machine gunner. He was from the Dallas, Texas area. Mm -hmm. Great guy. He wanted to go back on a second tour. I tried to talk him out of it, but he went anyway. And on his second tour, he was shot through both hips with a machine gun bullet. He received blood, a transfusion on the mm -hmm. battlefield. And what they didn't know in those days was hepatitis B. Mm -hmm. And he, re he, got, he was infected with hepatitis B from contaminated blood. And for his whole life, he suffered liver problems, um, and he died of liver cancer about four years ago. When you were in Vietnam, how did you stay in touch with like your family and friends who were back home? I communicated just by writing to them. I had a best friend in high school, a guy named Joe Doherty, who's a superior mm -hmm. court judge in Connecticut. I wrote him probably 140, 150 letters. Wow in a 13-month period. To my mother and my father and my brothers and my sister, it was all, it's okay, it's okay, mm -hmm. I'm doing all right. And then to Joe on the same day, I was telling him what, how bad it was. Mm -hmm. I wrote, actually during the siege, I wrote a letter to my parents to be read after I'd been killed because I was pretty sure I was gonna get killed wow. there. And I mailed it to Joe in an envelope and I said, when I'm dead, just give this to my parents. Wow. Still have the letter. But, you know, mm -hmm. but that's how serious it was at the time. Mm -hmm. Where were you when the war ended? For me, the war actually ended in the summer of 68 because I was in a naval gunfire outpost in the summer of 68, having endured the siege, all that bloodshed, all that terror, all that sleeplessness. Um, I mean, flat out scared for many days in a row. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a helpless feeling because we weren't engaged with the enemy charging forward. We were just in bunkers getting shelled day after day and your physical talents and your skills don't keep you alive. It's, mm. it's fate or religion, your God, if you believe in one, that's what keeps you alive, mm. you know, when you're being shelled like that. So now it's the summer of 68, we're out of Quezon and we got sea rations, food, ammunition and water on a helicopter resupply and the pilot at the last minute threw a bundle of Stars and Stripes newspapers out the window of the helicopter. Um, tat, you know, wrapped up yeah. with string or tape or something. And those were newspapers put out by the United States military called Stars and Stripes. They still do it, although it's probably more electronic now than it, than it was then. And they were actual newspapers. They had baseball scores and little trivia things and a crossword puzzle. And there was military information. And so anyway, in June of 68, Quezon had ended for us in April. And the guy throws these bundles out the window and a couple hours later I grab one and I'm sitting next to the bunker in this real sandy location near the ocean and I open up the paper and the headlines say the United States has abandoned the combat base at Quezon. Mm -hmm. And I went, what? <laughs> I mean, I couldn't believe what I was reading. And Wes Moreland, who was head, he was the army man, who was head, army general who was head of the entire Vietnam campaign, had gone home. A new general called uh, General Abrams had come in. He didn't want Marines in isolated combat units way up in the demilitarized zone, mm -hmm. so he made a decision to abandon it. And I, honestly, I sat next to that wall of the bunker and I thought, what are we doing here? Mm -hmm. What in God's name are we doing in this country? You know, in World War II, we didn't give back islands that we took. We didn't give back cities that we took. Mm -hmm. We didn't give back stuff in Korea that we took. And here we fought for the, we fought the North Vietnamese. We, we battered them at Quezon. We endured a lot for 77 mm -hmm. days. And now in the summer of 68, somebody decides it's not worth it. We're just gonna tear it all up yeah. and abandon it. And from that day forward until I rotated home, that's all I wanted to do.
mm. was come home. How like were you received by your family and friends when you first returned home? I'll give you the plane first. Okay. I flew from Da Nang, to, and in Da Nang we took off all our utility, our helmets, our flak jackets, all the weaponry, turned in our rifles, mm -hmm. and then I flew to Okinawa on a civilian jet, and then in, in Okinawa we took off the utilities, the jungle boots, and showered, hot showers, and real food, and mm -hmm. milkshakes, and cold beer, and all of that. And three days later we flew um, from Okinawa back to Los Angeles. And we didn't have to land at the airport at L.A. We landed at El Toro, which is the Marine Corps base. Mm -hmm. And they processed us to go home. And it was about 7 o'clock in the evening when we got there. And they have to go through all your gear to make sure you're not bringing home hand grenades mm -hmm. or parts of a Jeep or rifles mm -hmm. or pistols. And so the guy said to me, he was going through my stuff, and he said, so where are you heading? And I said, I'm going to Connecticut. He said, well, you should, you should get in a cab with a couple other guys and go over to LAX. You can get on the red eye at midnight. Mm -hmm and fly across the country tonight, and you'll be in Connecticut tomorrow morning. You know, I had 15 or 20 days leave. Mm -hmm. And so I did that. I got a couple other guys. We went up to LAX. Everybody went in different directions. I got on a plane, United Airlines this time, sat on the window seat, because mm -hmm. I don't fly that often. I like to look out the window, even though it was going to be nighttime. Plane is half empty. It's a Tuesday or a Wednesday, middle of the week in October of 68. And a guy in a business suit sat on the aisle. So there was a space between us, and mm -hmm. he took out his, he put down his tray, and he took out his briefcase, and he was flipping through his papers, and so he looked over, and he said, uh, I was in full uniform, and have ribbons on, and he said, uh, where are you heading? And I said, Connecticut. And uh, he said, where you been? And I said, I was in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. He said, did you see any action? And I said, yeah, a little bit, but I'm coming home now. And with that, he said, oh, and he went back to looking at his paper. We get up to cruising altitude, so what's that, 20 minutes later? We're probably over Las Vegas by then, and uh, this pilot took off the seatbelt sign, so you were free to get up and move around. And as soon as the pilot took off the seatbelt sign, the guy pushed the button, and the stewardess came up the aisle and said, yes, can I help you? And he said, yeah, I, I need a seat on this airplane as far away from this guy, jerking his thumb in my direction, Gosh. as you can move me. And she said, oh, okay, okay. And she bundled mm -hmm. up his stuff and his briefcase and moved him to another part of the plane, you know. And then she came by probably five minutes later and she said, I'm really sorry about that. And I said, it's all right. She said, um, when did you go over? And I said, September 67. She said, the country has really changed. Mm -hmm. It has really changed. And people are so anti Vietnam and Vietnam veterans. And mm -hmm. She said, you're not going to make any trouble, are you? <laughs> and I said, no, I got too many ghosts to carry around. I'm not mm -hmm. going to make any trouble. But on the other hand, when I landed, I landed in Hartford. No one in my family knew I was coming home. It was a total surprise. Mm -hmm. I wrote to them in, in September and said I'd be home at the end of October. And I knew I'd be home the first week in October. So I didn't want to call. I didn't mm -hmm. call from California. I didn't call from the airport at Bradley in the morning. I took a uh, Connecticut limousine down to New Haven and I was going to take the bus or get a cab mm -hmm. and the limousine driver it wasn't a limo it was a van they drive mm -hmm. he said so where are you coming from and I said Vietnam he said you know he said our last stop is New Haven they stop in Hartford and Bristol I guess and he's in New Britain and he said um, he said I got to return the, the van to the barn in West Haven I'll give you a ride to him when I'm done oh, wow. so he gave me a ride to yeah. my house it was a nice guy to balance mm -hmm. off the clown on the plane yeah. <laughs> um, and then uh, my parents were, you know, they were stunned, obviously. Mm -hmm. My mother was at home. My dad was at work. I just, I didn't even go in. I just knocked on the front door. Mm -hmm. My mother just about fainted there in the doorway <laughs> of the house. It was. And I'll get one more thing about coming home. Mm -hmm. I know there are veterans who say they were spit on. And that probably did happen. I'm not doubting their stories. But I am telling you that no one would have spit on me. Because if they had, I wouldn't be doing this interview. I'd still be in prison somewhere. <laughs> I, I would have killed them. I would have. I, no one would have spit on me in those. Mm -hmm. I was that crazy in those days. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a real aggressive person, but I would not have tolerated someone spitting on me. Mm -hmm. I'd still be serving life in prison somewhere. So how was it adjusting back to the life here, like other than just like the people here? Like the adjustment period, it's a. Uh, it's hard to put into words. In the beginning, it's almost like you don't even have to. You don't want to associate and remember what you remembered. And I can go back for a second if that's okay. Mm -hmm. When I came home from Vietnam, went home on leave, and then I had th 14 more months, I went back down to Camp Lejeune. And when I checked in in November of 68, 
the, gun, the, the master sergeant looked out the door. He saw my brand new 68 Camaro and he said, hey, Corporal, that's a nice car. And I said, thanks, First Sergeant. He said, I hope you enjoy it you're, for as short a time as you're going to have it because you're going to Cuba mm -hmm. on December 23rd for four months. He said, we rotate a platoon in and out of Cuba and your platoon's going. And I really resented going to Cuba for four months, but it turned out to be physically and psychologically four great months for me mm -hmm. in the sense I swam every morning, I, went, I lifted weights, I ate four meals a day, I played on the volleyball team, mm -hmm. I'd run in the morning with the company, I'd run at night. Uh, it, was, it was a chance to rebuild my body. Mm -hmm. It also gave me a chance to compare notes with other guys. And, you know, we didn't tell war stories so much as, I remember feeling bad about this or feeling bad about that, and mm -hmm. people would say the same thing. So I had that to help me adjust to the civilian world. Mm -hmm. But I got out of Yukon, and I got a job teaching high school English at Sheehan um, in 73. They'd only been open for two years. And I would say for the first couple of years, I really tried to put all that stuff behind me. How did your experiences over in Vietnam affect your whole life? Well, the Quezon experience, I have sleep interruption. I, I probably wake up 10 times a night. Wow. Wake up and then roll over and go back to sleep. Mm -hmm. And then half hour, 40 minutes later, I wake up again. It's just the way I've always slept yeah. ever since the war. But again, people didn't really know that you were gone. Mm -hmm. you know? I come back and people would say, hey, what have you been doing lately? Mm -hmm. I was in Vietnam, really? You know, but that's mm -hmm. how it was. Whereas in World War II, they put your name in the paper and yeah. your parents put a, put a star in the window of their house mm -hmm. to let you know that they had a son overseas somewhere, but it wasn't done like that. It doesn't let go, mm -hmm. for sure. It, it absolutely does not let go. Um, I can see a line of trees on a small hill and I can picture another hill mm -hmm. 15,000 miles away from here. Or I can see a cloud formation and, and think, wow, I can remember clouds kind of like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, see a pond or a lake or a stream. Or when it rains, like it rained this morning and then mm -hmm. stopped and then rained again. All of those images trigger memories from that time. Mm -hmm. It's, gave, it's given me a greater appreciation for the life I have, that's for sure. Um, I, I don't take it lightly at all. My, I, I lost 28 friends in Vietnam who I can name, mm -hmm. and, um, and a bunch of other guys as well. And I feel guilty that they were killed and I mm -hmm. survived. I have that what's called survival guilt. You know, on a day when things are really bad and stuff happens like that, and all of a sudden the smoke clears and everybody stands up and looks around and you, you are so happy that you're not wounded or you're not been killed. And then you look over and see someone else who has and immediately you feel bad. And it's just, it's a natural progression, mm -hmm. you know, and you have to work through that. It's part of that process. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to be too, this isn't graphic graphic, but when we were involved in the fighting during the siege of Quezon, the first night, our, our hill got partially overrun, mm -hmm. which, mean they got, which means the North Vietnamese army got inside our protected barbed wire. I was on a hill that was no, could fit on a football field from goalpost to goalpost. That's how small it was. Mm -hmm. There were only 165 Marines up there. And when the attack started at 1 o'clock in the morning, the North Vietnamese hammered that hill with every weapon they had. And... Within five minutes, they were inside the wire. During that terrible night, at some point, I was moving down the trench line with my radio operator trying to get to a better position to call in artillery. And you have to understand, it's one in the morning, gunfire, explosions, people yelling, you can't see. And we came around the corner of the trench line, and there was a machine gun bunker to, the, to our left. And I knew the guy in there, so I yelled his name. And his two uh, assistants had both been badly injured. Mm -hmm. um, one uh, subsequently died. And so I yelled to him and I said, hey, Billy, it's Dennis and David. And he said, come in, come in. So we got in the back door of his bunker and he said, where are you guys going? And I said, we've got to get further up. And he said, well, there's a North Vietnamese soldier in the trench line. And mm -hmm. I said, they're in the trench line already? He said, yeah, he's laying in the dark up there, maybe right out, right out the doorway of the bunker. And I said, well, we got to get by the guy. And he said, well, he's still alive. I can hear him breathing. Mm -hmm. He's talking. And uh, I said, well, we, we got to get by him. And he said, well, 
I don't know what to tell you. So I took my radio operator's 45 and I laid down in the dirt and I reached out in the dark and I touched this guy's head and when his head moved, I shot him five times. Mm -hmm. So I knew he was dead and I had to get by him and Dave and I moved by. I think about that guy all the time. I don't know whether there are people in Vietnam today, up in the north, who think about him, who are related to him, maybe mm -hmm. a brother or a sister or a nephew or a niece, but I think about that guy all the time, you know? And it's not a pleasant feeling. It's not a pleasant feeling. Mm -hmm. If I could do it over again, would I have done it differently? Yeah, but I don't get do-overs, mm -hmm. you know? And I think about that poor guy, and he died right there. And he died in his own country. I killed him in his country. Mm -hmm. It would be like if they came over here and, and we tangled in my backyard. Yeah. I mean, who would be right there? Yeah. You know? Politicians have to be very careful about where we send our kids mm -hmm. and why we do it. Mr. Manion for doing this interview on behalf of the Veterans History Project. I'm not saying I, you know, I'm not the most cautious, careful person in the world, but I do have an appreciation for the gift that we all have. Um, we only get one life. You only get one. Um, no one gets second chances. I mean, you can do little things over again, you know, but you don't, if you make big decisions, you're not going to get a chance, you don't get a chance to do them over. Teenagers ask me that when I speak to high school groups, you know, would you do it differently? Yeah, I would do it differently, but you don't get a chance to do yeah. that. You know, you don't get a chance to do it differently. So I had appreciation for life.